Hey, hey everyone, back again, finally, finally, back again in this classic podcast type way with Martin Heidegger's Being in Time. I told you this was a monolith, and it's, it really will be. But before jumping into it and explaining all the things I need to explain, hi, I'm David, if you're new here, I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you are new and you're on YouTube, you can like, share, subscribe. If you are listening to this on YouTube, you can find it as a podcast pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts, all the same names for things, because uh, that'll be great. And then you can just listen. And that'll be nice. If you want to help me out, do all those things I just mentioned, like, share, subscribe. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but no pressure to do that. And uh, yeah, let me do a lot of preamble, because I'm going to explain the scheduling for this. This is going to be eight episodes which is not good for any algorithmic purposes. Good thing I'm not catering to that. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have eight episodes. Hopefully you'll listen to all of them, but, you know, you, you have busy lives. Episodes one and two are going to cover the intro. Episodes three, four, and five are going to cover part one. And then episodes six, seven, and eight are going to cover part two. Now, in the description of this uh, episode as a podcast, YouTube video or whatever, wherever you're watching it, I'm going to have the breakdown there, specifically which chapters I'm covering in each episode, which will really help you along and situate yourself. Now, with this book, like my colleague Malik, at where I work at this, at the, in Los Angeles, uh, he was like, the way he described it was like, this book is like a detective novel. That is, you don't really know what's happening until the end. So <laughs> I definitely recommend or I recommend that you make it to the end, but everyone's busy. Now, clearly the elephant in the room, Martin Heidegger was an anti-Semitic Nazi supporter. No question about it. Absolutely he was. Uh, and this is something that we need to hold close to our analysis because we have to acknowledge the points in which his philosophy can contribute to such harmful things. Now, in this text, uh, you know, I think that there's really one instance where it can be found here but in any case I think that we always have to hold this really close to our analysis because Heidegger was very much the embodiment of the worst evils some of the worst evils that have ever existed or at least has supported the worst evils and then some people are like well oh, his favorite student was Jewish like Hannah Arendt and it's like okay do you, do you know about tokenism or do you know about what he wrote in the black books or his black notebooks? I mean, like, he, I don't want to repeat it, but he did not look kindly upon uh, Jewish people and Jewish culture, which doesn't mean that we have to do away with all of his work. I think that there's a lot here that can actually undo or challenge many of the tenets of national socialism that we saw in Nazi Germany, which might seem ironic. Uh, specifically what we will see in his attention to care and locating care as the foundation or almost bedrock of Dasein, which might not make sense right now, but it'll make sense as we go along. So anyways, keep that. I think it's important to keep that in mind here as we go forward. So is that good? We're good? Let's cover Martin Heidegger's being and time, which I have so many problems with. <laughs> I'm going to be totally honest with you. This could have been like 150 pages. He, Heidegger does this thing where he repeats stuff 10,000 times, but in the repeating, he'll make a, like, there'll be the tiniest adjustment to the observation or to the thing he's repeating than when he first mentioned it. And it's so difficult to follow that line of reasoning because you don't know at what points he's just repeating something at one point he's adding to something or slightly changing it and then we'll make a big claim like oh we have now solved this issue it's like i don't i don't think you have but in any case there's still a lot here so let's start with the forward so dasein is the primary focus of this text dasein is a term that emerges here and that will come up throughout the course of this text and it's the focus of his analysis and dasein the definition that he gets, gives us right off the bat is that it is the being concerned about its own being. Or, to use the proper language, uh, Dasein is almost a self-reflective sign 
being. It is being that reflects upon itself. Now, each one of us are a Dasein or are the expression of a Dasein and having been born and existing in the world and sharing the world with people. Dasein are those beings that exist in the world and that have some kind of like will or existence in the world and do things. So like a rock doesn't have Dasein. Does an animal? I mean, I don't know. I think that that might be up for debate, but humans certainly do. We are each our own Dasein. Now, it's also important to note that this text was never finished. Being in time is incomplete. And as you will see in, as we get to part eight, spoiler alert, he doesn't actually solve the problem that he sets out to solve. He gives us a lot and provides a lot of hearty analysis into the nature of the world and being itself that is, I think, really valuable. But he doesn't actually solve what being is. That is, what does it mean to be? Are we just like these material things that just float around the planet? Or is there something more to being? Where does the very potentiality of life, of being, come from that can be reflective, that can exist in the world, that can share a world? So this book was supposed to have a second part that almost looked at the history of, I think was supposed to look at the history of the discussion of being or people's efforts to understand being, but that was never completed. So before actually beginning the book, or beginning kind of the meat and potatoes here, Heidegger muses on the passage from Plato, or from a passage from Plato, that goes, For manifestly, you have only been aware of what you mean when you use the expression being. We, however, who used to think we understood it, have now become perplexed. And that's from Plato, you know, 2,500 years ago. Plato is saying that we in the you know in that philosophical tradition have lost an understanding of what it means to actually contemplate being to know what being is so like in english if i say i am what is the thing saying the i am am i an i or an i am i an am and what are the stakes for not considering this question so what we will see throughout the course of this book is that Heidegger is concerned with our glossing over the question of being and just focusing on, I guess, phenomena in the world, the ontic conditions, things happening in the world without any real consideration of the driving impetus behind these things. And it is only by doing that, by looking at what he will call the fundamental ontology, that is the very nature of being itself for anything to come into existence, it's like life potential. I'm using very bombastic language to describe this, but I just want to make it as clear as possible. While so, uh, you know, intense Heideggerians will be like, don't use that. that you're you're going you're gonna to confuse them. And if I have confused you, I'm sorry. But he's concerned with our lack of attention to the question of being and instead just like being, uh, being like, it doesn't matter. Let's just focus on what we do know, you know, things that we see and can touch. And like, let's not w wonder like what exists underneath, what might be like a universal principle of that being or a fundamental ontology. So this book is guided by two fundamental questions. That is, what is being or what is sign, S-E-I-N in the German? And he also asks how or, and why have we lost our ability to comprehend being, to be able to recognize it, to contemplate it? He does this by interpreting time as the possible horizon for any understanding whatsoever of being. Now, that, that might seem kind of out of left field. What the hell? What, what are we talking about time for? As we will see, Heidegger is going to make the case that being is intimately connected with time. There is no being that can exist that exists outside of time, which if any of you happen to know about Kant, you don't need to have known to know about Kant. I'm going to explain everything when we do get into stuff related to Kant. I'm going to explain exactly what you need to know. So don't worry about that. But if you do know about Kant, you might say, oh, well, this just sounds like Kant. Kant says, yeah, we kind of, we exist in time, not that time is like out there in the world, 
but that within our minds as I forget, he says it's sensible objects of the intuition or something time is something that we have a kind of innate capacity to grapple with but that opens up the question does time exist in our minds or does it exist out there and so you have all of this heidegger is saying something somewhat similar the difference and we're going to get into this is, i think this is one of the biggest problems of this book the difference is that kant also says that we have to exist in space you cannot imagine us not existing in space whereas heidegger says that space is not really part of this equation that is if we actually look at what makes up the world and people's existence in the world it is the process of despatiality or de-distancing so when we actually engage with people we are trying to shrink space we don't exist in it per se and he's very clear about that and i think it's one of the weaker points of his argument but we're going to get into that as we go on here and that puts us here into the introduction in chapter one and then after that we're going to be done for this episode and get into chapter two next time so the introduction titled the exposition of the question of the meaning of being so here he's going to be setting that stage for what actually it means to question the meaning of being what is being and how do we even question it so chapter one the necessity structure and priority of the question of being so in ancient greek philosophy being although a question or a concern that has faded was still a concern it was one that was plato and aristotle took very seriously in actually trying to find the foundation for all possible knowledge how do you form you know how do you form a, a, a perfect society unless you consider the very ontology of being itself that you can cater to in the world however heidegger says that by the time we get to hegel you know i guess hegel about like 2000 years later the question of being or being itself has become only a ghost essentially haunting hegel's work and i think we could say the same thing about every post hegelian uh, philosopher up until heidegger and heidegger is trying to revitalize this question of being um, and you know as we will see he doesn't solve the he doesn't solve it right he sets out to solve it what it is he doesn't do it he gives us some characteristics of it that i think are semi-accurate <laughs> but he doesn't actually solve it and i think that that should encourage us to ask like isn't this just a dead end route what is the point of this question of being oh and if you hear i live in los angeles so if you hear there's always noises so, I, I, I don't want to go on a rant this helicopters every five seconds and police cars making noise and trucks and so please sorry if there's extra noise but we have to ask what is the point of discussing being is it something like discussing something like the infinite with that we'll never know and so like honestly we can be you know we should be allocating our mental energy to actually things that matters or things that matter like ending poverty like dealing with systemic oppression and racism but anyways you know i think in disregarding that maybe there is nothing to actually discover with being maybe there is no such thing as the temporal horizon of being as he will come to show but by the early 20th century we thought we didn't need to explore the question of being any longer and this is a problem for heidegger he thinks that we have to really hold this we have to take it to account we have to really hold it close to us because otherwise we wouldn't actually be able to have a foundational understanding of the world if we don't engage in the question of being we then for heidegger ignore the question of the world itself because the world is a condition upon which being is made possible that is we need the world for being to exist but also being is itself the condition for that world so there is a kind of give and take relationship here and as we will see he engages the question of the world as well this book i think also could be called world in time so let's get more into the history here 
So in part, this disavowal of being or this kind of glossing over, covering over of being, go, it does go all the way back to the Greeks. So some of its early investigations, like with Aristotle, Aristotle referred to it not as a categorical designation of different genera, but as the universal quality of everything that is being itself. In universalizing it, in, in universalizing it, he provided people after him with justification not to explore it. That is, Aristotle just said, like, oh, it's it's everything. So therefore it's almost like it's nothing. Like don't don't bother going any further. Besides Aristotle, others believed that it was undefinable in its universality, like Pascal, for instance. And so it was not worthy of investigation. If it can't be defined, it can't be seen, it can't be understood. For Heidegger, this doesn't mean we can't dispense with the question of its meaning. Like, there's still something there. Just because we can't define it doesn't mean that we can't explore it, we can't investigate it. And then still others believe it's self-evident. And its self-evidence makes its investigation unnecessary. I mean, I exist, right? And that's all that matters. Who cares? Heidegger thinks that, no, that that's not really where the story should end. And that is because this firm belief in being, without like actually engaging with it, without understanding it, this actually necessitates its exploration. I mean, to exist is like wild if you think about the entire possible, uh, t- entire po- like manifold possibilities in all of the universe, and the very impossibility of life itself. That is, life coming out of non-life, and the the conditions that were that were necessary to actually create life. And how life and the possibility for being is not just like a haphazard occurrence without necessarily invoking God or anything. Like, we are confronting something that's very important, I think, and one that it does deserve some degree of speculation. And that's all that this will will really be. It is just pure reason. (laughs) It is just speculative, uh, speculative exploration of this possible question armchair philosophy that doesn't actually really it claims to deal with the real world and heidegger will start with the real world and use that as a foundation to grasp the actual foundation but you know does it it doesn't really do much i don't think sorry i'm gonna dial back the criticism because it doesn't actually help here in any case he's dedicated to this question he wants to unravel what being is to find out what is the fundamental ground of all possible being, and the world then. So before we can actually grapple with being, these disavowals make it clear that we must first reestablish the very question of being itself. So these people are all like, Aristotle's like, it's universal, right? doesn't matter. Others are like, it's undefinable, so whatever. And others are like, well, you know, I just exist. Who cares? There's nothing more to it than that. And in these, Heidegger suggests that we have essentially lost the capacity to even recognize that there can be a question about being. So we must first reestablish that question. What does it mean to question, though? To pose a question? And this is something that Heidegger will often do. Like this text, the question concerning technology. He's very peculiar about, or he's very systematic in breaking down the constituent components of any process of questioning in order to get like the most, to set the stage at a mo- like the most skeletal, rudimentary level before proceeding. So what does it mean to question? For Heidegger, it is a seeking, a searching for being in their thatness and their whatness. So when we question, what we are doing is implying our own, our own beinghood. That is, we are Positioning ourselves as something, as an investigator, as a questioner. And that questioner is aligned with something else, something to question, something to investigate. And in that, we, we give ourselves a kind of being, we, we assume a kind of being. So questioning is an attitude adopted by a being about a being. So when we ask the question of being, we find ourselves necessitating that very question itself. And which is a, and it's a you know jargony way to say that when we ask the question about being, 
we are making ourselves a being or becoming aware of our own beinghood in the capacity to question, therefore necessitating that we are asking the question. We are, we are setting that very condition for the question. We are kind of providing the stakes for it right there. But being and questioning, doesn't it doesn't just happen out of nowhere. I'm not one day just struck by like a lightning strike of knowledge that's like, okay, now I must consider being. This book kind of feels that way. Like reading it, it's like, okay, it does, it does feel like a lightning strike. Like, oh, maybe I should be considering this question. But the act of questioning itself implies already some prior knowledge. To ask the question about being implies that we already have a sense of what being is. That is, it is an object of investigation. An investigator, like in the police, wouldn't know to investigate something unless there was a sign of something to be investigated. And the whole history of philosophy, even from Aristotle, Pascal, and others, even when they kind of disregard the question of being, they are still implying that there is a thing called being. There is something there, even if we can't get a full grasp of it, or if we can't fully understand it, really. And it comes out in like, who is the thing that says I am? When I say I am, what is saying the I am? What, what is that thing? Is it me? Am, am I, am I, am I? Like, it's just, it's just an endless cycle. Of like, I am always pointing to myself. But when we use language, which is all the only thing at our, at our disposal, and what I think is one of the pitfalls of this text, and Heidegger not really considering that, he tries to use language and he's very, he pays very close attention to language to get outside of language, which from Kant, we know that like you can't just breach the world that we see and feel into the metaphysically. You can't just make that leap. Where Heidegger thinks that almost thinks that you can with language, which is why like I think that as we go through this, he's always defining things. He's drawing upon words and everyday usage to point to the metaphysical. That is that which exists beyond the physical world, that which exists underneath the I am. What is the being that says I am? But can, can language do, can we actually make that leap? I mean, I don't know. He doesn't do it in the end, but in all he does is add words to our understanding of this thing, keeping us within the realm of language, keeping us in within the realm of like what we can see and feel and touch and like nothing that actually moves us to understanding being any closer or maybe, maybe it does. I don't, I don't, I don't know. So on this, he writes that what is sought in the question of being is not completely unfamiliar, although it is at first totally ungraspable. So we have some sense of being, as I've said, but are far removed from grasping the being that is itself not a being. We need a new conceptual framework for this task, one that accounts for our implication in the question of being, and the question to, also this question, what does it mean to be a being? But one of the other things that struck me as I was reading this is he's, he's trying to find a fundamental ground for being, what he calls fundamental ontology of being. But what is the fundamental ontology of that being? Do we just, are we just opening up an endless chain of signification almost? A being, by even supposing that there is this ground, we have to ask, okay, upon which does this ground rest? Is this ground like a bedrock? But as we know, every bedrock is not like the bottom. As we know from the universe that might be infinite, who knows, there's always something underneath it. And so is that, are we, are we doomed here in like even posing the question of being like, I don't know. Uh, anyways, so we have some sense, right? We, we understand that there is this thing called being and we have to reestablish the framework that will permit us to actually explore it, to pose the question about being. So where do we fit in asking the questions? What are we doing? We, we, we know we are establishing ourselves as a being. We are concerned about being. We aren't just like floating around in the world. We are a being that is contemplating being itself. Therefore, we are Dasein, self-reflective being concerned with the question of being. So in asking the question, 
We are creating a being, one who questions, and this is Dasein. While this may appear circular, it is not because we don't become this being an answer to the question of being. It happens to, to, uh, it happens to us without our comprehension. We are constituted as a being, but we don't know what that is yet. Now, by focusing on us as like being constituted as a being, even in like, it doesn't just happen when we pose the question about being. We are always a being. We always, you know, come from some, there's some being within us, some drive to have existed, to like come into, into the world and be part of the world. It might seem that Heidegger is making it like too tangible in us, like pointing to the very act of questioning as being uh, like a demonstration of Dasein, that is the being who contemplates being. But he, he's not really doing that. And his defense is that this person who's questioning isn't a point of entry to arrive at being. They are instead a site to understand being in the being, in the question of being, which, <laughs> again, we get this problem of like, is being just an endless process of signification? There's There's no like, final being, the true original being that doesn't itself have another being. Or like, maybe think about this in terms of theology, like, if there's a God, what created God, right? Where, where did God come from? We still are presented with a fundamental problem here. If there's an edge to space, what is outside of that edge? You know, like, it, it, w w is it just endless? Like, what, what, what is this? Now, how is this different from like science? Well, Heidegger makes it clear that this process is different than the scientific method, as we kind of popularly understand it, in that he believes its development, that is science, its development comes from investigating and exploring things that are just out there in the world. Science is not concerned with what conditions these things or like gives them their being. It's just concerned with like ontically, ontically referring to like what is just out there in the world, what I can touch and see and feel you know, things in their kind of factuality in the world. Science is concerned with that. So to believe that is to erase the motivation and the being behind the scientific method itself as a being. Because if we acknowledge, as we acknowledge that questioning was a site to constitute a kind of being, which opens up the question that we, we can even pose the question about what being is itself, so too does the scientific method. When the scientist is like, I am this thing and study this other thing. There is, the, I, am, I am a being that can do this, do this process. I can question uh, some kind of a being itself, even though its investigation will only exist, will be concerned primarily with the thing as it exists, like in the world that it can see and touch and measure and everything like that. So what propels science, like in a more romantic way, I think for Heidegger, is the extent to which it is capable of a crisis in its basic concepts. And this is, I think this is a really good point, in that what makes a science a science is not that it's just concerned with investigating, but that it is always prepared to undo its own investigations. And this is how science develops, right? It makes observations, it changes its methods, it questions itself. And in that, you know, there is... What is the driving impetus to even question itself? Or like in like the Hegel thing, like self-consciousness, which you don't you don't need to know, but the self-consciousness is like a very is a determining factor of human of the human experience. We can reflect upon who we are. Where does that drive come from? I mean, if we are just like just beings that just happen to have existed on a rock in space. It seems strange that we have this thing called consciousness, let alone that this consciousness reflects upon itself and always adapts, always changes, always transforms into what is not like evolutionarily necessary. We, we, we are like, there's more to us than just trying to satisfy our needs on the planet. We strive for more. The scientific method strives for more. It questions itself. And so in that is, you know, even though the scientists might not be totally interested in this question, Heidegger's like, that's a good site to also like open up the very question of being itself. So the question of being then would go beyond science to look at the a priori. That is the condition of the possibility of the sciences and the condition of the possibility 
of the ontologies which precede the ontic sciences and found them. So what this science will always be, uh, it, it will always be limited as long as it's just concerned with things out there, like in the world, and doesn't actually question the very questioning of being itself. And it's in those moments when people have actually like taken a step back and been like, is this all it is? Is there not more to this act of being a scientist or like the being of science itself, questioning that, that science moves forward and changes and develops? So the being concerned with its very being is Dasein. And we all demonstrate it to some extent. For Dasein to be though, a being must be disclosed to itself. It must have some kind of ability to reflect. If Dasein is a being concerned with being, they are a being that is aware of their own being and are able then to reflect upon it, criticize it, challenge it, transform it. And this requires being aware of oneself, disclosing oneself to it to oneself, or Dasein must be disclosed to itself ontologically and be open to exploring being of being, the ontology of ontology, which again, like, is this really just like the being of being of being of being endlessly? Who knows? Dasein goes beyond material qualities, though. It goes beyond the material world uh, that, you know, things that just kind of can just change in, in the world itself and, and sets the stage for the condition for existence itself. It is that bedrock that even permits things to exist, things that have a shape and form and exist in the world and exist among other existences. However, Dasein is always related to existence, for it thinks through the question of being by first comprehending its existence. And this is a super important qualification, and I've already kind of hinted at it, in that in this book, Heidegger approaches the question of being by looking at where he says being is like only expresses itself in the world. And he uses that as a point of departure, which I think is important because he doesn't want to say that there's just like existence in the world where things exist. And then there's essence or ontology, which is like the underneath, the true universals of any given being or of being itself. He thinks that these two things are very, they're intimately connected. You can't just bracket off the real world and pretend like, you know, you can just think therefore you are or something. Like it, you know, like, you know, Descartes is like, hey, I can doubt everything in the real world, but I can't doubt my own mind because that would take my mind to actually doubt it. So you, your mind can never go away, but everything else I can be unsure of. Heidegger's like, doesn't have any time for that. He's like, we live in the world. Let's be real. Like, we can't just bracket that off and pretend that this is just like menial pursuit of, of like a scientific investigation of things that don't actually point us to any fundamental ontology or truth of being. He is using this as a starting point to get at being. So Dasein is always related to existence for it thinks through the question of being by first comprehending its own existence in the world. So its comprehension of existence is not just an experiencing it, what he calls an existential, T-I-E-L-L, gel, -L, but in analyzing the structures that constitute existence. So an existential, an existentiality, which is hard to, this distinction is hard to make uh, verbally because existential and then existential, you know, there might be moments where I don't say them quite differently. These kind of don't have a huge place in this book. <laughs> they, they will kind of disappear. But the distinction he's making is between existence is not just its self-experience of itself, which is an existential. He's also concerned here with the structures that constitute existence, existentiality. So I'm going to refer to them as existential and existentiality, not existential and existential, just to make it clear. So this looks at the structure, or at least existentiality, this look at the structure is important as a method to look at the structure of being itself. So is it is it endless? Like, is it, again, is it like structure of structure of structure of structure? 
So to arrive, though, at the what he thinks is the fundamental ontology, or the bedrock structure, or the bedrock being, he calls this the, the fundamental ontology. He says that the fundamental ontology from which alone all other ontologies can originate, so this is the bedrock, it must be sought in the existential, the existentiality, the structures, in the existential analysis of Dasein, looking at the structures of Dasein, not just like individual Daseins experiencing themselves. That, that's a point of departure. He's using that, he will use that to then make this bigger uh, leap to looking at the very structures of Dasein itself. So in order to understand being as Dasein means understanding the world that is existing in the world and being of beings accessible within that world. So again, we're not bracketing off the world. We're not saying that experience in the world is not important here. It's very important here. So here are some important definitions to add just to get them under your belt. I've already think made them clear, but just to really get them under your belt. So ontic is defined in its being by existence. Ontological, this is existence itself. It's very kind of identity beneath just its uh, outward expression in the world. What is that fundamental ontology, that true defining characteristic of what a being is? Ontic ontological condition of the possibility of all ontologies. So these things are connected. It's not as though the ontic, the things in the world and the ontological, things beneath the world that, that are the kind of true, to be really vulgar about it, the true identity of a being, of the world, of like an essence. These two things come together, and these are Dasein's priorities. Its priority is to engage with the ontic ontological condition of the possibility of all ontologies. Dasein can't be understood as any being, but as fundamental ontology itself, which means it is both the ontic and the ontological. Okay, but there's an issue here. There's an issue here, and that is if we have now agreed that we are trying to understand Dasein in the question of being, by asking the question about being, and the question of being is a quality of Dasein, Aren't we already that haven't we already solved the problem? And that is that if we okay, so uh, to illustrate this in um, in a way that makes sense to me, it might not make any sense to you. I, uh, I went to like a planetarium not too long ago, and it was this exhibition that was just like you watch a film, essentially, where you start from Earth, and like you slowly move out into space, and you go as far as like, we, we can now see in space, which is pretty cool. And like, you know, <laughs> what we can see of space is probably like one to the 10 millionth of a fraction of what the actual 10 millionth, like the, in, like it's infinite, right? It might be, I don't know, but it goes on for a really long time. And then at the very end, it comes right back to us again. And it's like, Okay, we can be concerned with the infinity of space. Sure, there are some people out there really curious about that and they're doing work. But what it really what what is really important here is that we as humans in our minds have that capacity to contemplate the infinite. So maybe we can solve the question by not looking outward but looking inward as to this possibility of even grasping with the infinite. And that is exactly what he's doing here. That's exactly why he doesn't want to bracket off the real world. He's like, what can we learn from our experience within it to discover this potentially endless chain of being? So we are after the pre-ontological understanding of being, but we only do so by looking at us in the world and are just existing with it. And the most banal things we will look at, like one's engagement with a hammer, or street signs, like what What do these tell us about being? And I think that that's, you know, that's kind of what we're going to do here. So that, I'm going to wrap that up there. And next time we're going to do chapter two of the introduction. And then we're going to get into part one, do three episodes of that. And then we're going to do part two, do three episodes of that. And then we're going to be done. 
Is it going to be eight weeks? It's going to be two months of this. I hope you stay with me the whole time. Uh, but yeah, or wait till the end and then listen to them all at once. I promise you it'll be worth it. This text is riddled with amazing insight, uh, even if he doesn't solve the problem he sets out to solve. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. If you, there's anything I got wrong, let me know. I'd love to hear about it. Anything I excluded that you think, oh, David, you really had to mention this from the foreword, from the introduction. I'd love to hear about it. Uh, but yeah, on that note, hope you're all taking care of yourselves and see you later.